adventure, sports, outdoors. With host, Billy Canterbury. There I was, back in the wild again. And I fell right at home, where I belong. I had that feeling coming over me again. Just like it happened so many times before. Would you take a gander at these? They kind of look like a hybrid between a palm tree and a cactus. Some of the rarest things on earth seem quite alien. It is mentioned in the Holy Bible that this Joshua tree grows only in two places in the world, at the entrances of heaven and hell. I'll let you decide which, one of those places being Southern California, here in Joshua Tree National Park, and the other being Iraq, Welcome back to another edition of Adventure Sports Outdoors. Join me today as we visit Wildlife Prairie Park in central Illinois. They have a beautiful new addition that everybody should check out. Then we're going to visit Jim Conover, author, filmmaker, man of many stories. And uh, I'm really looking forward to sharing a few of those stories with you. Then we're going to check out an ASO Rewind, one of those classic ones, of the one and only, my father, Harry Canterbury. Stay tuned for a wonderful show. Adventure Sports Outdoors is brought to you in part by Corsall Lumber, manufacturers of quality hardwood products, buyers of standing timber in Smithfield, Kelleher's Irish Pub and Eatery, located on Peoria's Riverfront, open 11 a.m. daily. The Peoria Sportsman's Club, delicious dinners every Tuesday from 5.30 till 7.30 and Friday from 6 till 8 on beautiful Spring Lake in Manitou, Illinois. Goodwill, supporting our veterans with job placement assistance, health, housing, and resource referrals, and the General Wayne A. Downing Home for Veterans, all because you shop and donate. Our thanks to all of these sponsors. Hi, I'm Andy Oberly, the Wildlife Director here at Wildlife Prairie Park, and love my job. One of the reasons I love it is because I get to encounter wolf pups and adult wolves, which we've had about five months, and they're a year old, but these guys are only six weeks old. So let's go check out the adults and our puppies. We'll tell you all about them. curator out at Wildlife Prairie Park. Hi, I'm Kenzie and I am the primary carnivore keeper here at Wildlife Prairie Park. And we've got our two young girl wolf pups. They don't officially have names right now, um, but we are having kind of a voting contest if you donate money and you get to um, have a chance to pick some names. And then um, we pick from those names and have a vote and all the information is currently on our website. So we do kind of have nicknames for them to help us tell them apart, but they don't have official names yet. And they're about eight weeks old. They are not related to our other wolves that you might see kind of running around behind us. They are so excited right now because they want to get all of the equipment. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they're about eight weeks old and they come from different facilities, but um, eventually they will be out in the yard with our other wolves. It'll be a slow introduction. We actually tried a little bit of it today and 
uh, she got a little bit more feisty protecting her sister. It was great. <laughs> so these guys came to us back in December from Minnesota, um, and these guys are gray wolves. Sorry, she is just very, very squirmy. Um, but these guys can get about up to 150 to 175 pounds, and they are just quite different in the fact that uh, they can withstand very cold temperatures and a lot of different um, ecosystems. Uh, they have a lot of thick fur and very heavy paws that are able to withstand that rugged terrain. Uh, they are carnivores and have very sharp teeth, and so they are all out there hunting for uh, various mammals. They uh, are pack animals, very social. Our pack is very amazing, and um, since they've come here, we have been able to decipher their personalities between each of them. It's so great to learn how they interact with each other. They'll play tug of war, they'll play. We do have an alpha. We have a, um, the most lowest of the totem pole is Sumac, and he's the most friendly boy. Uh, he was actually really friendly with these two this morning, but they are uh, very cool creatures, and we feed them with um, various donations of meat from our wonderful donators. Uh, since we are a nonprofit organization, we do rely on uh, donations, so um, we are very thankful for that. But uh, these guys eat all kinds of meat, like chicken, beef, uh, deer. deer, venison, <laughs> yeah. all kinds of stuff. Yep. So yeah, and uh, we feed our pack uh, 20 pounds a day. The easiest is probably our Facebook page or our website. We have a special spot on there. You can click on it and choose what you would like to donate. Um, as for other donations, like meat donations, um, you can take that to the ticket gate. There's a little freezer up there where you can drop that stuff off and we just check it every day and then move it to our animal kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> or call me, the wildlife director, Andy Auberly at 309-256-0832. Be happy to come get that donation or meet you somewhere if it's a large one. <laughs> We even take whole deer cart. <laughs> it's going to have so many strange phone calls now. <laughs> really, our big event for the summer is going to be two, three cougars that are coming, mm -hmm. and we're going to go pick them up in the Upper Peninsula on May 31st. So these cougars are nine months old. They'll probably be 80 pounds. They're three females, and we're completing their den and enclosure right now. So we're going to have three handsome, lovely female cougars to look at. Big event for the summer. So cougars, um, just with their anatomy, um, aka claws, uh, we're going to be a bit more careful with them. Now, they were raised around people kind of like the wolves were, but we'll have them as a um, non-free free contact animal, which means that um, if we need to go into their yard, we won't be going out with them. Um, the wolves, uh, we can go out there as long as we're in a group, um, and of course keepers only and everything like that. But they're just a bit more of a dangerous animal. They still have, they're still going to grow a little bit, but they can also get to 120, 130 pounds each. Um, that's probably a bit on the heavy end for a female. But <laughs> <laughs> you want to dig her now? Maybe she's getting tired of me. Um, but yeah, so the cougars, we do have a few animals that we have no contact with at the park, and the bears are another one. Um, and that's just for human safety. Um, even though they were raised by people, um, they might try to play with us like we were cougars too, and <laughs> that would hurt us very much. So that's just a safety thing. The um, public but, can see the cougars yes. on an overlook area, yeah. and there are three other viewing areas where they can watch them. So they'll be able to see them from all sides of the new enclosure. And hopefully they'll be up on their den area and on top of it and interacting with some of the guests when they come look at them. Yeah, that enclosure will be a little bit different from the last one. There's a lot more viewing areas for, for guests and they expanded it quite a bit. So that'll be really, really awesome for those cougars. Come back later in the summer and we're gonna have two new bears, two year old bears, and they will be right along the main trail area here. So they're beautiful. They're probably 300 and 325 pounds right now. And they're waiting for us to complete renovations on our current bear enclosure, and then we'll go get them. Lots of new animals. <laughs> we hope to see you out here this summer at Wildlife Prairie Park. I'm here with author and filmmaker Jim Conover. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thank you, Ken. I'm uh, proud to be here, actually. Um, you were once a police officer. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me about that. That's correct. Uh, I spent 20 years on the Pekin, Illinois Police Department, and it was during that time that uh, I had picked up a little newspaper clipping about some desperados of the 1800s that terrorized this uh, location for a 
lot of years, and uh, finally it culminated with a, a kidnapping or ambushing a posse and murdering a deputy. And the, then they lynched, uh, they gathered up all the owner uh, gang members and lynched the leader of the crop. And that was the inspiration for your book. Lynch law. Right. I kept that little article, newspaper article, I think. D.L. Uh, Dancy did that. Uh, C.L. Dancy. He was writing for the Pure Journal Star at the time. And I kept it for years and years while I was on the department. And then my last year or two, I picked it up and decided, well, I think I'm going to write a book. And I was just going to write a little pamphlet, but it turned out. Jim Brecker, another police officer on the police force with me, he joined me. We did research this whole area. And then in, uh, in the end, we ended up writing a book called Lynch Law. And of course, it wasn't published for several, several years. And I finally decided to publish it on my own. And uh, uh, that was the result of my first book. Tell me about some of your other books you've, that books? you've worked on. Yeah. Well, that was kind of an inspiration for me. And I got to the point where I was, uh, I felt like I had to write something else. And I was a treasure hunter for years in my hobby, you know, running metal detectors, traveling around all over. And I'd been out in the Superstition Mountains and not out in them, I'd been close to them. And so I decided I'd write a novel. And I wrote a novel and it was uh, Greenhorns and Killer Mountains. And uh, as a good book, it's about five guys that get laid off and from a closed Chevrolet plant and go in search of the Lost Dutchman's gold mine in uh, Apache Junction, Arizona. All right, and you also did a series of books. I did. I, I, I uh, decided if I could write that as a novel, I could write a series. And I started writing a series about a detective out of Chicago that operated in Chicago, Deuce Riker. And uh, so far I've got three of the books written, published, but one's written and not published, and I'm working on the fourth one. And that was a lot of fun because I incorporated uh, a lot of my police work into it. I spent about 15 years as a police detective uh, here in, on the Pekin Police Department. And uh, it was fun writing it. So I, I wrote it in first person like it was me. And it was fun. So he operated out of Chicago, so I had to do a lot of investigating in Chicago. You can't just sit down and write a book without knowing your places, your parts, your people, you know, your geographical locations for those parts. So your, uh, your police work also led into a documentary about a book you wrote. Yes, it was. Uh, now, that was, I wrote the book on it. It was called Slayer of Innocence. And after that, we saw one of the cases during that time, but not both of them. And after that, I decided, uh, or I didn't decide it. Uh, some friend got with us, and we did, made a documentary off of the book. It's on uh, Apple and Amazon Prime. Yeah, and, and being over. yes, and being distributed throughout the United States off of uh, Netflix has got it. All the big stations has got it. It's streaming all over. Okay, well, let's take a look at the trailer for the documentary Freight Train: Slayer of Innocence. Here it is. In the 1970s, children went missing in the Midwest, only to be found dead. We uh, searched everything we could search out there. We searched the boxcars. We searched the, the 4-H fairgrounds. We followed every lead that we could follow out there. They all had something in common. We were looking for any similar cases where young boys may have disappeared from uh, state fairgrounds or railroad tracks nearby. They were looking for a serial killer. William Gottney. He had a nickname of Freight Train, and he got his nickname by hopping the freights all the time. He was a hobo. He rode the rails. He could make a whistle like a freight train uh, sound just like you were standing next to a, a freight train. It's quite loud, and the kids all loved him. Do the freight train no! 
We knew he killed Mark Helmick. We knew he killed uh, uh, Marty Lancaster in Normal, Illinois. He killed the two young men in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. It was uh, Topeka, Kansas. You want to ride a train, don't you? Well, come on. We talked to two young boys here in town. They told us that they had seen Mark Helmick talking to a hobo on the railroad tracks. Where are you going to take Mark? I'm going to take him on a train ride. Marty Lancaster left his house on a bicycle. Tied to the handlebars was a fishing stringer. It appeared that his hands had been tied behind him with that fishing stringer. Freight Train. You also made a Western movie, an entire Western cowboy movie that got distributed worldwide. Tell that, that was, I think, uh, a strictly fluke. But I, uh, I really enjoy Western movies because I believe that uh, the people in the uh, Western days who actually settled this part of the country, all across America, settled America, I think they were some great, hard work and honest, good people from all over the world. So I've always liked Westerns, and I was uh, in here talking with some friends of mine one time, and I said, uh, you know, we ought to make a movie. Well, I'd never made a movie before, so what did I do? I uh, got together with some guys, called in a bunch of people I knew, and including you. That You've was been in, in on everything I've done, <laughs> That Kenneth. was in like 2005 or 2006? That was 2005. Okay. We started, I think we started talking about it in 2004. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I'll do this then. I'll write a screenplay. And we'll see what we want to go from there. So I wrote the screenplay and it looked pretty good. So it was a Western, a U.S. Marshal and family, kids keep being kidnapped and so forth, right here locally, or in, sorry? Texas. Texas, San Prairie, Texas. <laughs> San Prairie, Texas. And now to the most recent film that you've been in. You not only appear in this documentary, but video footage that you shot in 1988 is a big part of this documentary. Tell us about that. Well, we had a new story that was moving into Pekin, and we had a condemned school. So they decided that they'd tear that school down and build a big grocery store called Coach Myers on that, on that property. Well, when they started digging, they discovered that there were bodies buried on it. And with a little research, we knew that they were, they were on the old Tharp Cemetery Part of it was, and over the another corner of it, there was an Indian burial grounds over there. Well, the documentary is not out yet, but uh, we do have a trailer. Yes. Let's take do. a look at the trailer. They called it the Blue Death. The wrath of God is upon us. Repent! Repent! The wrath of God is upon us. Peking gets hit with an epidemic of cholera. It was a major event in Pekin's history in July of 1834. Pekin has always had a, a bad spell. In fact, during the time of the episodes with the cholera outbreaks, it was known as a, the pestilent hole of the country, and nobody wanted to come here at that time. If you have a severe case and it's not treated, you'll be dead in, in t two days or less. They built pine boxes uh, and in such a hurry, and people was dying five or six a day. Some of the most prominent people in the town at that time died. Mr. Smith, Mrs. Cauldron, Thomas Snell, Mrs. J. C. Moore. Dr. Perry was helping to treat the cholera victims as best they knew how. As a result, he catches it and dies from it. His wife catches it, she dies from it. Nance Costley, the first slave that Abraham Lincoln freed in 1841. During the Pekin outbreak of cholera epidemic, she took care of patients and helped doctors. 
putting her time and her life on the line. The cholera epidemic of July of 1834 here in Pekin is responsible for the creation of Pekin's very first cemetery as the Tharp Pioneer Burying Ground. Douglas School was built in the early 1900s, a smaller school on that site where the cemetery used to be. Before they built the school though, they closed the cemetery and they moved the burials. And there were stories among teachers at Douglas School and, uh, and students, this used to be a cemetery. There's, you know, and of course, probably some ghost stories got started. And that was the school that was then, uh, after it was closed, that was when it was raised in 1988. And it was during the construction and grading of that ground that they found out that those old stories the kids and the teachers had been telling were true. When they tore the old Douglas school down, they found bodies. When I arrived at the site, there was still um, heavy equipment still working there. Some areas had been stripped clean, and uh, there were outlines of coffins that were clearly visible in the subsoil. They found at least one burial, where it was evident that they had built the coffin around the body very hastily. Because they used very long spike nails to finish the coffin, and they drove those nails into the bodies, got them in, ground, in the ground very quickly in that way. They put the bodies in a common coffin and moved them out to Lakeside Cemetery, where they dug a grave and buried the coffin. And at that time, they were gonna put a monument. I noticed from a picture I just recently saw that uh, they didn't put a monument up out there for those people. The Blue Death, coming soon. Jim, thanks for visiting with us today on Adventure Sports Outdoors. All right. Thank you for letting me be here. Good company like this. Hi, I'm Dave Barth with your Sportsman's Tip of the Week. With ammo prices getting higher and higher almost on a daily basis, you might want to consider reloading, especially rifle and pistol shells. It doesn't take that much of an investment and that much equipment to get started. You need a reloading press, you need a powder scale, a powder measure, and uh, dies. A nice accessory to have is a case tumbler. Of course, you need media for the tumbler, it's not a necessity that you have to have something like this, but it just cleans your brass and you get a good look, looking cartridge uh, when you're done. Now, if you want to save some money, you can buy all of this equipment in a kit and it's everything you need to start reloading except a set of dies. I'm Dave Barth with your Sportsman's Tip of the Week. Kathy and I had a great time on the Spirit of Peoria, but we also got to film and follow the guys and gals fishing on the Illinois River with bow and arrows for Asian carp. Uh, it was the Redneck Fishing Tournament, which was a great, great thing to, to watch and to see, to uh, watch them shoot uh, bow and arrows at fish that some of them were only that big and a lot of them were a lot bigger, but it was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed that. So stay tuned for this next day.
six pounds. 19.96 pounds. We've got a new leader for Big Fish. 146 pounds. Hope you enjoyed the show about the Illinois River. Uh, it's where I recreate, it's where I hunt ducks, it's where I fish, it's where I used to ski, getting too old to ski now, but it's where I boat and uh, I love the Illinois River. It's not what it used to be, but uh, she's been cleaned up, it's a great place to go and uh, if you just like to drive down and take a walk along the Illinois River, it uh, is really a very beautiful place to visit. My dad, in 1939, when he graduated from Manual High School, his ambition in life was to be a riverboat captain, and I know why. Uh, it's just a neat, neat thing to do and a great place to go. Adventure Sports Outdoors is brought to you in part by Corsall Lumber, manufacturers of quality hardwood products, buyers of standing timber in Smithfield, Kelleher's Irish Pub and Eatery, located on Peoria's Riverfront, open 11 a.m. daily. The Peoria Sportsman's Club. Delicious dinners every Tuesday from 5.30 till 7.30 and Friday from 6 till 8 on beautiful Spring Lake in Manitou, Illinois. Goodwill, supporting our veterans with job placement assistance, health, housing, and resource referrals. And the General Wayne A. Downing Home for Veterans. All because you shop and donate. Our thanks to all of these sponsors. You kind of feel like you're in a Flintstones movie being amongst all this granite that was carved out by the ocean millions of years ago. It was Teddy Roosevelt that created the first national park, which was Yellowstone, I do believe. After that, it really took off. He uh, established Mount Rushmore, the Panama Canal, and many more national parks. And they're being preserved to this day. And it's a direct reflection of us as Americans, our freedoms and liberty. We take care of that. We also take care of our liberty and one another. All you really have to do is take care of yourself and it takes care of everything else. I also kind of feel like Huckleberry Finn being alone amongst all of this nature, just Mother Earth and I, and also our ancestors. These national parks really are sacred sites. As always, I love having you here, and so do my parents. In the words of my father, keep your powder dry, your worm wet, and we'll see you next month. Stay true, warrior.